Carl's here. This is a 2022 micro. Question number one. This is set one. Oops. This is set one. All right. Let's see if we could do this. A firm has a patent on a new carbon capture technology, making it the only producer of that device. The firm is currently earning a positive economic profit. First of all, only producer of that device. That's monopoly, right? Uh, the firm is earning a positive economic profits, and it's at profit max level of output. Draw a correctly labeled graph of the firm and show the quantity that it produces, labeled QM, the price it charges, labeled PM, and the area representing consumer surplus. So all we're doing here is drawing a nice monopoly graph. Don't forget your price and quantity on the axes. We have a downward sloping demand because it's a monopoly. Marginal revenue is below demand because they have to lower their price to sell additional units. And we want a marginal cost curve here. It's Nike swoosh. All right, and we know that profit max is always where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So that's the first thing we're going to do is we go where marginal cost and marginal revenue come together. And that's going to show our, show our quantity of what this monopoly is going to produce. Let's call it QM straight up until we hit the. Now, this is not just demand. This is DARP. Don't forget it because they like to test it sometimes. This is also the price. Every quantity's price has to bounce off the demand curve. So we come straight up till we hit the demand and we bounce to the left. This is our price. Let's call it PM. They are telling us that we're making a positive economic profit. So we need to draw our ATC below the price. Now our ATC just needs to be below the price, right? Uh, it could have been there. I could have drawn it a little higher doesn't matter. As long as it's below the price, anywhere below the price, I know we're making positive economic profits. Then in one of this, in the way we would just say that, is anytime the price is uh, greater than the ATC, we know we have profits, positive economic profits. The area representing consumer surplus, consumer surplus is everything above the price, but below the demand curve. So we need to know that. It's nice to have that definition in our head. So everything above PM, but everything below the demand curve. So all of that triangle right there, we would shade in as consumer surplus. Easy enough. All right, B, the government is considering different options to regulate the firm. Suppose the government is considering taxing the firm. Could using a per unit tax change the firm's output to the socially optimal quantity? Well, obviously, you need to know that the socially optimal quantity is always where price equals marginal cost, right? Where the price equals marginal cost. Now, again, that is the price that this firm charges, but that is not the price where marginal cost equal one another. That part, that spot right there, what we would always know as allocative efficiency is um, what we call the socially optimal quantity where price equals marginal cost. So let's see if I can let's change the uh, do I want to change the color here? Do I really care? Let's change the color. So what I recognize is that price right there and that quantity right there is the socially, let's call it PS, let's call it QS. Now, what I recognize is that if this firm was to produce there, it would have to lower its price, right, um, to be able to do that. But if the government is going to tax this firm, if they taxed them right now, they're not going to produce more of this good. They're going to produce less of this good. To get them to produce more, we need to give them a subsidy. If we taxed them, they would produce somewhere over here. They would produce less than the socially optimal quantity. How do we explain this? The easiest way is just to say their price is greater 
than marginal cost. That implies that they can't be allocatively efficient or produce a socially optimal quantity. We could say that there's dead weight loss. That also implies that we're not producing a socially optimal quantity. Or we could they say they produce less uh, than the socially optimal quantity. All of these are nice ways to say it. I probably would have given them at least that one. That's what they're looking for most of the time. But this obviously in this situation is pretty clear on what's going on. All right, number two is suppose the government imposes a price ceiling so that the firm produces the socially optimal quantity. Uh, on your graph, label the quantity and price of the price ceiling is imposed. So now let's change this because this would be our price ceiling. Understand that this is the market price. If a price ceiling is imposed, it has to be below market equilibrium. So our price ceiling would be right through there. Let's call it PC. Um, and then they want us to do QC. So we'll change that QS to, Q, oops, to QC. All right, so this is now our price ceiling. Sorry for being kind of sloppy there. Um, Let's see. Suppose they're going to play the firm social graph, label the quantity. We did it. Okay. So QC right there, labeled. At the price and quantity identified is the firm earning positive economic profit. Now, look at where they're producing. If they're producing at that price and that quantity, the price is greater than the ATC. If price is greater than the ATC, yes, they are making a profit, right? But what if I would have drawn originally, what if I would have drawn my curve like this something, my ATC? What if my ATC would have gone like that? Now, originally my price was still above the ATC, so they were making profits, not very much, but they were making profits. But once they move to this output here, it's below that average total cost curve right there. So in that situation, we would have said price is less than the ATC, so they're making losses. Now, again, if you had to draw it right through there, you might have said there if the price equals the ATC, they're breaking even. Now, again, this is one of those situations where your reader is going to look at the graph and he's going to see what you did. And as long as you did it correctly, you could get all the points by answering it obviously correctly. So... No big deal there. It's just about knowing what you drew, how you drew it, and recognizing that one of these has to be true, depending on how you drew it down. All right. I uh, see. In my situation, though, clearly there's prices greater than my lower ATC that I first drew there. So uh, that's why I said profit. All right. Assume the government decides not to regulate the firm. Instead, the firm produces the quantity of output that maximizes total revenue. We should know where maximization of total revenue is. And I'm just going to draw a quick graph here so that you can see it. But this is my demand curve. This is my marginal revenue. Here's my marginal cost. We go to profit max. That's the first thing we tend to always do. Find profit max. Let's call it Q. Let's call this P. Don't forget your P's and Q's. Now, to know where max revenue is, max revenue is always where marginal revenue equals zero. So where your marginal revenue hits that lower axis there, where the quantity axis, that is where revenue is maximized. So we should know this. Um, this is one of the four big things about monopolies that you just kind of have to know where they all are. Uh, and now it says if the firm were producing here at that quantity, at that price, um, Let's call it max revenue, Q, max revenue, right? Easy enough. If now the firm increases its output by one unit, so now they're producing, let's say, right there. What I recognize about anything to the, let's say, down the demand curve from that spot, any quantity I produce over here, well, marginal revenue is negative. Can we see that? And if I'm producing that quantity right there, that's my marginal revenue. If I produce that quantity, that's my marginal revenue. If I produce that quantity, that's my marginal revenue. What we recognize is that's in the inelastic section of the demand curve. 
monopolies will never produce an inelastic section of the demand curve because marginal revenue is negative. They're losing money on every unit of good they produce. So the marginal revenue would be negative. And we would just explain that uh, in that producing past the point of maximizing total revenue, uh, our marginal revenue is negative uh, because we're producing in the inelastic section of the demand curve. And I think that's what they're looking for right there specifically is that you are in the inelastic section of the demand curve. And we should just know that. Uh, starting at the total revenue maximizing quantity, if the firm reduces the price, would the quantity demanded increase by less more? So this is recognizing, again, that if you lower the price on a monopoly graph, anytime you lower the price, there's going to be more demanded. So at that price, that's the quantity demanded right there. As you lower the price for monopoly, more is going to be demanded. As you lower the price, more is demanded. Um, we should recognize that if we're at max revenue and we lower our price, more of this good is going to be demanded. The question here is whether uh, quantity demand would increase by more or less. Well, it's inelastic. Or we know we're in the inelastic section of the demand curve. So we should recognize that if we draw a graph, we should be able to make sense of these. And I'm going to test you here for just a second. I'm going to draw this demand curve. And I'm going to draw this demand curve. Now, which one is elastic? Which one is inelastic? And you should know by now, hopefully, that the more straight up and down, the more vertical, right? The more vertical, oops, I'll draw it again. That's perfectly inelastic. And I'll give you a quick tip of how to remember that. If I put a little cap on the top there, does it look like an eye now? This is perfectly inelastic straight up and down, little cap makes it look like an eye. Whereas if it's perfectly horizontal, if I put a little cap right there, does this now look like an E? This is perfectly elastic demand. So we need to know both of those. It's a quick and easy way to remember. This is more straight up and down, so we're, this is what we call relatively inelastic. This one is what we call relatively elastic because it's closer to being horizontal. Now, if you and I both chose a price, and I'm going to go here, down, and then I'm going to go, let's say, here, and I'm just going to draw this straight across. Oops. Right? And then I should have drawn this straight across, too. Recognize what's going on here. Here's P1. Here's the price 2. The price has gone down. Let's just say it went down by 10%. Look at the difference in the quantities here. At P1, that's the quantity, that's the quantity there, but when the price falls to P2, that's the quantity with the inelastic demand. Notice that little bit of gap there, that's how much quantity demanded has changed. Whereas if it was relatively elastic demand, we went from Q1 to Q2, we can see there's been a huge change in quantity demand. This makes perfect sense if we remember our elasticities. The more inelastic, when the price goes down, quantity, any price goes down or up, quantity demand changes by a smaller amount. That's what makes it inelastic. If the demand is elastic, we're much quicker to walk away from it. So if they lower that price, a lot of people will walk away from it. Quantity demand goes down by a whole bunch. So this kind of represents that we knew we were in the inelastic section. Therefore, we knew that it had to decrease by less than 10%. I hope that kind of makes sense to you or you can see it there. Um, all right. If not, get in touch with me. We'll go over it, make sense of it. Uh, I'm on Wiseant. Just look for Charles, Charles W. And this is all I do is AP economics. So you can find me and if you need help. If not, uh, I hope this helped. Keep working hard and um, it'll make sense to you. Be safe. Bye.